In this lecture, we're continuing our discussion of rules for ethical rules for litigators and advocates from the ABA's model rules. And this time we're going to be talking about model rule 3.6, which is about trial publicity or talking to the media um, when you have a trial underway. Um, at the outset, I want to uh, mention to my students, um, we had, as you might expect, a lawyer challenge the any restrictions and, and it's happened again and again that lawyers will bring First Amendment challenges um, to any restrictions on speech uh, or public statements that the ABA or the state bars try to impose. And the um, and in this uh, particular case, back in the not early 90s, the Supreme Court uh, forced the uh, uh, overturned the existing rule, and the ABA had to modify it and allow more exceptions and spell out um, more details. Um, I'm not going to dwell a lot on that case, um, <clears throat> but we are going to talk about the current model rules with talking to the media. And just be aware, this has been challenged, and the rules have been adjusted to fit with Supreme Court precedent. A. A lawyer who is participating or has participated in the investigation or litigation of a matter shall not make an extrajudicial statement that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know will be disseminated by means of public communication and will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding in the matter. And so we're talking about um, everything, just to be clear, we're talking about everything from uh, talking to reporters on the courthouse steps to um, uh, posting something on social media about a pending case and, and talking about it, if it could influence um, uh, the matter, have a prejudicial effect on the matter. B, now here's our safe harbor provisions about what you are allowed to say. So just to make sure you understand, uh, you're clear on we start A with a lot of our rules with a sweeping broad prohibition. <clears throat> and, um, and when we say extrajudicial, we mean out of court. So we're not talking about in, in court statements, we're talking about outside the courtroom. Um, and then you know that either it's going to be just, you're talking to a reporter, you're putting it online, so you reasonably should know that other people could copy it and paste it and forward it and so forth and that it could actually have an effect on the trial. Now, here's things that you're allowed to stay, state. One, the claim, offense, or defense involved, except, and except where prohibited by law, the identity of the persons involved. So it, it, it's not a prohibition of talking to reporters and saying, <clears throat> yes, that we are suing someone and we allege that this injury happened or that they committed this tort or that we're the proper owners of this copyright or something like that. And um, or what crime was committed or that you plan to raise a defense of either an alibi or a, an affirmative defense like um, duress or insanity or entrapment or something like that. Two, information contained in the public record. And so if reporters could have found it anyways, then it's not really a problem it, pretty easily. Then it's not a problem that the lawyer um, uh, uh, disclosed, said something to the media that in theory anyone could have found out. Three, it's always okay to say an investigation of the matter is still in progress. Four, the scheduling or result of any step in litigation. So it's okay to say we're doing jury selection on Monday. The judge denied my motion for summary judgment. So to merely sort of ob objectively describing uh, procedural steps or the scheduling trial is due to start next month or something like that is okay. Five, a request for assistance in obtaining evidence or information necessary thereto. <clears throat> so, um, and we see this from both sides. If you read the lawyers' magazines, you'll see plaintiffs' lawyers running ads. Has anyone else by, been injured by this drug or <clears throat> this type of appliance or something like that? We're looking for information about it. And of course, you've seen um, cases where uh, local law enforcement goes on, or the, the DA goes on the news and says, if anybody, if there's any witnesses out there, we'd like you to come forward. We want to talk to you. Um, six, a warning of danger concerning the behavior of a person involved when there's reason to believe there exists a likelihood of substantial harm uh, to an individual uh, to an individual or the public interest. And so um, the, uh, you've, you've heard the press announcements, uh, be on the lookout that we have someone who escaped from custody and we're, he's considered armed and dangerous and so forth. And that is okay if there is a genuine threat. 
in a, uh, this is a special rule for criminal cases. So now we're on 3.6 B7. And what is you're allowed to say to the media in a criminal case, in addition to the foregoing ones we mentioned, uh, one through six, you can say the identity, residence, occupation, and family status of the accused. Two, if the little two, if the accused has not been apprehended, information necessary to aid in the apprehension, like where they were last seen and what kind of car they were driving or what they were wearing or who they were with. Three, the fact, time, and place of an arrest, and four, the identity of the investigating and arresting officers or agencies and the length of the investigation. Now, seven um, B seven little one or little I often surprises students that it's okay for either the DA or the criminal defense the defense attorney um, in a criminal case to say, um, look, this person is single or this person is divorced, this person lives uh, lives at this street address. Um, and or works at this workplace. And while it is true that that's, um, uh, it, it does, uh, it could result in other people finding them, um, it can also cre uh, clear up confusion where people have the wrong person. So um, uh, after uh, that horrific Las Vegas shooting massacre um, at that concert in, at the end of, I think, 2017 or 2018, um, and the, the name of the shooter was released, um, it turns out that there's, I don't know, 30 or 40 people with the same name around the country. And so everybody suddenly thought that their neighbor or coworker or, or so-and-so was a mass shooter. And so it, it, it actually can, can protect the innocent to say, we mean the Drew Stevenson who lives at this street address in, um, in Kingwood, Texas, and who works, uh, is on the faculty at this law school and so forth, so that um, uh, people don't start harassing or accusing or mistreating uh, um, the many, many other Drew Stevensons, I'm just kidding, um, out there. Okay, C, 3.6 C, notwithstanding A, here are some more things that you can say, and this is responsive action or damage control. A lawyer may make a statement that a reasonable lawyer would believe is required to protect a client from substantial undue prejudicial effect of recent publicity not initiated by the lawyer or the lawyer's client. And a statement made pursuant to this paragraph shall be limited to such information as is necessary to mitigate um, the recent adverse uh, publicity. And so I'm going to uh, uh, go back to full screen here for a second and, and give a couple examples that I would normally give in class. So um, one would be uh, a high profile case, and some of my students know it happened long ago, you may not remember, of um, Enron, the Enron fiasco, where we have a big corporate scandal where executives are being uh, uh, arrested and accused of defrauding millions or hundreds of thousands of investors and um, and crashing the economy and, and things like that. So we, uh, from time to time, we have this huge like corporate collapse, major corporation collapse, and there's a lot of media attention about it. And then, um, and so if you're the, the lawyers for Enron uh, realized it, it was going to be hard to find a juror who hadn't already heard all of the negative press coverage about their client, so it's okay in a limited way to push back a little bit about that in the media, and, and, but only to push it back to neutral, right? And, and, and not to open a new can of worms or something like that. And to explain, well, the media reports are saying this, but a lot of this, for example, hasn't been proven, or it's not clear who was responsible for what, or um, we think the reports are being exaggerated, and, and, and so on and so on. I'm going to give another example, um, and this one is more tragic, right? So um, several years ago, there was this incident between these two individuals, and most of you, most of my students have heard of, of um, a man named George Zimmerman, who was sort of a um, self-appointed neighborhood um, watchman or vigilante or super, I guess he thought he was some kind of superhero. So he would, um, with no government authorization, decided to patrol his neighborhood armed with a firearm um, at night looking for bad guys. And there was a young, um, uh, a black teenager named Trayvon Martin who was not from that neighborhood, was visiting an, a, a relative, um, staying with a relative for a little while there, and who had gone and walked to a corner store to buy candy or something that a 14-year-old would do. He was unarmed 
And so George Zimmerman, the self-appointed like neighborhood watchman, um, to, uh, confront, accosted him. A confrontation ensued that somehow turned into a scuffle. And as most of you know, um, uh, tra tra this ended with uh, George Zimmerman shooting Trayvon Martin to death. And so there, was, uh, there were protests about this, a national uproar. And I have a couple of things to say about this, about the lawyers. Not about the case. I'm not a fan. I don't want anyone to think I'm a, a fan of George Zimmerman. I'm not. He's had trouble. He's been in trouble with the law since then, and um, and and so I I'm not on his side at all. I actually personally am opposed to stand your ground laws and things like that. And I think it's awful that an unarmed um, teenager who it seemed like was mine wasn't committing any crimes uh, was was killed. So. On the other hand, the prosecutor in that case um, held a press conference with some civil rights leaders and, th and things like that and made um, a lot of really inflammatory statements. It seemed to me at the time, when watching the video, that, um, this, uh, that the prosecutor, uh, first of all, was trying to stir up um, social unrest and protests and things uh, about it and, and, um, and prejudice the proceedings. And so um, going back here, it was, it, to me, the prosecutor violated 3.6 and a rule we'll get to later on, 3.9, which pay, places, creates an even higher standard uh, for prosecutors and made a lot of inflammatory statements about George Zimmerman um, uh, that were played on the national news. And so in, in my view, the prosecutor in the case, even though I, I have no problem with him being prosecuted, made some um, across the line in terms of this rule uh, in her press conference. Then in response, um, you may remember that George Zimmerman's lawyer released a video to the media of George Zimmerman um, in his uh, holding cell when uh, the night of his arrest and uh, appearing to show scuff marks, cuts and bruises and things like that uh, um, to support his claim that this was self-defense, that he um, was he was got in a fight and was losing and uh, drew his weapon in self defense, um, and to that extent, to that extent, um, what the lawyer did at that point in the litigation was actually exactly what this rule is talking about was probably appropriate um, uh, given the circumstances and the the public media attention, the inflammatory statements of the prosecutor to release a video. It, it, there wasn't a lot of extra commentary with it and so forth, and you could watch the video and decide for yourself. And so C, um, this by the way, was added after that Supreme Court case that said that the old rule um, infringed on free speech rights. Um, C allows a lawyer to kind of do an offset um, media statement when something that, now you can't, uh, uh, when something else, someone else has already created a lot of unfavorable media attention. Please notice that if the media attention was caused by you, um, like you exasper, uh, you created this or you started it, then um, then C, it doesn't apply to you. Okay, D, no lawyer associated in a firm or government agency with a lawyer subject to A shall make a statement prohibited by paragraph A. So if you are the DA prosecuting a case, you can't just have another lawyer, prosecutor from your office hold the press conference or talk to the press and make the inflammatory statements that you wish you could make. Um, so this is going to apply to your whole law office um, or your whole prosecutor's office or whole public defender's office, um, something like that. Um, now, I do want to say from a, a note from the comments of about 3.6, this doesn't apply to lawyers not involved in the case. And so um, uh, that's the end of our rule, and we're going to move on, but I want to make a few more comments about it. And so now can you as a lawyer talk to the media or have a blog or something about cases that other lawyers are handling that you're not in a firm with? Of course. So if you want to go on um, CNN or Fox News and pontificate about um, uh, some sort of pending case as a lawyer, there is no ethical prohibition against you doing that. So it's not; a, it's only about a case where you are the advocate on, a, on one side in that litigation. Then we have some restrictions uh, on it. And what the Supreme Court has said is that they said it survives First Amendment scrutiny to have some 
um, some limitations in the interest of preserving the integrity of our trial system and our court system um, to say that lawyers can't just go out and basically try to try the case in, in the court of public opinion before they ever get to the courtroom. So that's 3.6. By the way, we have another rule, 3.8, that's a very, that, that includes very similar provisions ratcheted up a little bit for just for prosecutors. And uh, so we'll move on to our next lecture uh, from here.